we've reached our message in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, Christ's message to the church at Smyrna, which we find in verses 8 to 11. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. You recall in all of these messages to the churches, what Jesus says about himself at the beginning is very applicable to the situation the church found itself in. And here, to the church at Smyrna, Christ reveals himself as the one who always was, who always will be, who gave his life, and took it up again. You remember how he said to his disciples in John chapter 10 that he would lay down his life only that he might take it again. No one took it from him but he laid it down of himself. He had the power to lay it down and he had the power to take it up again. This is the Jesus who is addressing the church at Smyrna and it shows how he understood every detail of the church's situation. The problems the church was facing, well frankly it was a matter of life and death. And Christ shows that he is the one who has conquered both life and death. And he is able to help the church in their difficult time. That's very reassuring. Because even though we live in a different time to these early Christians, and our circumstances may be very different to the circumstances in Smyrna, Jesus is fully aware of your needs and mine, wherever we are. If I were preaching tonight to some church the other side of the world. I probably need a translator to tell them what I was saying in their language. But I would know, friends, that Jesus is fully aware of their circumstances, where they are, what they're facing, and, and of yours and of mine. The Lord understood the pressure on the believers at Smyrna. They were suffering persecution. And at this time, they were enduring extreme poverty. Frederick Tapford, if you've read his uh, comments on the book of Revelation, which are very helpful, he suggests that it was the result of the plundering of their possessions by those who persecuted them. Quite simply, you could be fined for being a Christian in many places in the early days of the church. But although they were not rich in worldly goods, Jesus assures them that because they remained faithful in difficult times, they were spiritually rich. I've got that in brackets in my version of uh, Revelation 2, verses 8 and 9. But you are rich. You are poor, but in brackets, but you are rich. That's spiritually rich. They were laying up treasures in heaven, as Jesus had taught in, on the Sermon on the Mount. Don't lay up treasures on earth. Instead, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. The church at Smyrna had learned the truth of how to do that. They put spiritual things first. And no doubt this wealth could be seen. If you ever meet a wealthy person, you won't meet them in this church, but if you ever meet a wealthy person, you can generally tell. Perhaps they've got a flashy watch on, or they're wearing the finest clothes, or they're driving an expensive car, or something like that. Wealth can be seen. Friends, spiritual wealth can be seen at just as easily. The spiritual blessings of love, peace and joy. These Christians were rich in these things and everyone would know it. Everyone can tell if you're full of love. Everyone can tell if you're full of joy. Everyone can marvel when they see the world falling apart all around them and you've got perfect peace. It's the kind of riches money can't buy. But the kind of riches that God is pleased through his son to give us these blessings, these riches, are of supernatural origin. They don't come from the shelves of the supermarket. They come down from the Father of lights in heaven. God is the supernatural origin of these spiritual blessings. And the effect of what is spiritual, although it is unseen, it's no less real. And so it's tangible. Have you ever seen someone... Perhaps they've been through a difficult time in their lives and God has ministered to them by his Holy Spirit and they rise from prayer and their faces are beaming with a kind of light. It's a joy. It's a peace 
God has done something for them, and everyone can see it. There's a change even in their, their faces. The, the worry, the, the, the anguish has gone, and Christ has been glorified. You see, just because something is spiritual doesn't mean it can't be felt. It can't be experienced. <clears throat> Jesus points directly at the problem that these Christians in Smyrna were having. And he refers to the blasphemy they were experiencing. The blasphemy Jesus is talking about, of course, was directed against God. All blasphemy is against God. But this blasphemy was directed at the Christians. It was a reproach against them. It was basically saying that their God was not God. Their religion was not right. Who was guilty of this blasphemy? It was a group of people who Jesus said were of Jewish birth. But spiritually, they were not God's people. Do you remember how... Paul, writing to the Romans in chapter 2, verse 29, tells them that, uh, 28 and 29, he is not a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and the circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. They may have being Jews, they may have called themselves Jews, but they were not right with God. And that's a lesson we can carry through into every religious situation. People can be very religious in the Christian faith without being right with God. Did you know that? And it doesn't mean to say that just because somebody's a Jew that they're going to blaspheme Christ, they may not. The early Christians didn't have this problem with every Jew everywhere. But in this place, there was a group of Jews who were antagonistic against the Christian faith. They blasphemed Christ by opposing and denying the truth of his teaching. They professed to know God, but in fact they were children of the devil. Do you remember what Jesus said to some of his own countrymen in John 8, 44? They were arguing about genealogy and their descent from Abraham. And Jesus said, you are of your father the devil. Why did he say that? He said, well, because you are trying to kill me. You could hardly call Jesus anti-Semitic, firstly being a Jew himself, and secondly, all his followers were Jews too. But he was certainly laying out the truth that until we are born from above, as he taught Nicodemus in John chapter 3, until we are born again of God's Spirit, we are all by nature children of the devil. The marvellous truth Jesus explained is that children of the devil can become children of God when they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This group of Jews, Jesus refers to them collectively as an assembly or synagogue of Satan. Uh, some believe that we have historical data to show that the uh, Jewish community in Smyrna for some reason had a particular hatred of the Christians, not forgetting who were these Christians in Smyrna? Well, most of them were Jews as well, who would have left the synagogue when their teaching was rejected by the other Jews who did not believe in Jesus. The beginning of the Christian movement, it, it, it should not be oversimplified. Um, <laughs> the Bible doesn't teach that Jews are bad and Christians are good, but it teaches that there can be occasions of religious hatred that are instigated by the enemy of men's souls. And that's still true today. Religious hatred can be found in all corners of the world. Whenever anyone from any religion whatsoever opposes our faith in God's only begotten Son, if they accuse Christians of blasphemy simply for holding the teaching of Christ, they show themselves to be falling under the influence and power of the evil one, just as Jesus said. Most of us here are familiar with Open Doors, the Christian charity that keeps a watch on the persecution of Christians around the globe. And if you've noticed their latest list, which was the 2020 list, 260, 260 million Christians are 
living in places where they are or can be in some way, shape or form persecuted for their religious beliefs. The reason that's significant is it's risen from 245 million in 2019. Back in 2014, and we've got the old map still on the board here, North Korea was the only country ranked as extreme for its level of persecution of Christians. But in the 2020 report, there are 11 countries that now fall into the category of being extreme in their persecution of Christians. Let's remind ourselves it's not only Christians that are persecuted. Nevertheless, there is extreme persecution in some nations of Christian peoples. Over the last year, Open Doors estimated, and this is an easier figure to quantify, attacks on church buildings have risen by 500%. Reported attacks on church buildings globally in 2019 were 1,847. In 2020, there were 9,488. Now, bearing in mind there can be discrepancies, there can be margins of error, but 500%, you can't account for that by, you know, getting the counting wrong. This is a genuine increase in attacks against Christian churches in our own town of Pontypool. We've had one church suffer an arson attack recently, and other churches be robbed. Um, and the, the chap who tried to burn down the Baptist church up the road uh, claimed he was told to do it by the voices in his head. These things are, are tragic, but very real. The International Society for Human Rights estimates that worldwide, 80% of all acts of religious discrimination or persecution are carried out against Christians. So they're not the only people persecuted, but there is an overwhelming sense in which Christians are particularly a target, even today in our world. This was the situation of these Christians in Smyrna. We haven't got the details of how they were being targeted, but it was very real in their lives, I can tell you that. And Christ speaks directly into the situation. In verse 10, the Lord says that uh, terrible things were about to happen. They may indeed have been things they were already familiar with. Some would be imprisoned, although some could even die. And yet Jesus says, I am with you. He didn't promise to deliver the Christians from persecution. Instead, he promised more was on the way. We can always be sure of that, can't we? As Christians, we believe it's part of our carrying the cross of Jesus. If they persecuted me, said Christ, they will persecute you also. Now, persecution isn't always about torture and death. Persecution can be when people try to silence us. Persecution can be laws made by a country that restrict the activities of certain religious groups, and of Christian groups in particular. There are many different forms of persecution. Even with friends that you've known for a long time, if, like me, you're unfortunate enough to be on Facebook, you post something Christian, and those friends you've had for a long time will soon try and shoot you down in flames. All right, it's a very mild form of persecution, but I could still use that term to describe it because they're piling on the hate simply because of my faith. They wouldn't dare do it if it was my sexuality or, or my, my race. But it seems that somehow in our country it's permissible to attack people for their faith, but only if they're Christians. Jesus tells his church not to fear any thing that was about to happen. Satan would raise his hand against them. Some of them would be thrown into prison. This happens in some countries in our world today. State-sponsored persecution. In the United Kingdom it happens very rarely, very sporadically, that perhaps a street preacher or a Christian organisation will fall foul of the law um, over some confusion as to what the law actually says. By and large, we are not victims of state-sponsored persecution in this country. When were you last jailed for being a Christian? But in Eritrea, you would be. In many parts of the world, 
he would be jailed simply for becoming a Christian. In some parts of the world you can be executed for simply becoming a Christian. I've known Christians, I know of a, a, a leading surgeon in the town of Tehran, where you know I have friends, he became a Christian on the Sunday. So he got on a plane with his family Monday morning to defect to the West, because he knew he couldn't get away with that um, in, in Iran. You can't be a Muslim becoming a Christian easily in many countries of the world. That kind of change of religion is uh, against the law. Notice what I'm saying there. State-sponsored persecution. The law says you cannot become a Christian. That's the definition of it. When Christians are arrested for preaching Christ or for acting according to their Bible-informed conscience, whatever is the pretext of the law or the authorities... We are then verging on the state-sponsored persecution of Christians. It's all very well for the Conservative Party and those in the House of Commons and the House of Lords to listen to the Bishop of Truro's report and talking about the persecution of Christians around the world. They need to make very sure that they're not passing laws which move in the direction of facilitating the persecution of Christians, I'm using my words carefully, here in the UK. Because what a law intends and what its consequences can sometimes be are not always exactly the same thing. There can be unintended consequences of ill-thought-out legislation. And in our nation, what's happening, there are so few Christians in politics today that when the decision-making process is taking place and a law is being considered, and what are the possible consequences of that, of that law, no one's able to speak up and say, hang on a minute, did you have... Did you Stop for a minute and think that Christians could inadvertently fall foul of this law. For example, because they believe that marriage is between a man and a woman only, that is the teaching of Christ, which it is the teaching of Christ, and those who wish to hold to that teaching, by some readings of certain laws, could get themselves in trouble. We need to be careful when we make legislation. That we are, if we are fair to one section of the community, it must not be at the expense of another section of our same community. State-sponsored persecution or per persecution just by individual people can only be allowed if God permits it. Do you remember the story of Job? Satan had to go into the presence of God and ask God's permission before he could lay a finger on Job because Job was a servant of God. And it's the case for these Christians at Smyrna, it's the case for you and I and every Christian in every generation. Fear not, says Jesus, when the devil throws some of you into prison. It's only that you may be tested. In other words, I've got you in my hands. Your faith may be tried, but it will be found genuine to the glory and praise of God. Christ promises that this persecution would only last a certain time. It's interesting that he says, you will have tribulation ten days. It's very likely this reference to ten days is literal. Otherwise there's no reason for it to be there in the text at all. Even if it wasn't literal, if it was a symbolic ten days, which sounds ridiculous, but you'll read that in some commentaries, the Lord assures them it would not last for long. Christ encourages them to remain faithful even if it meant their death. And this is where we come to the closing words of Christ to the church at Smyrna. It seems that some would in fact die. That's extreme. Can I add a note here? There have been um, a, a lot of discussion recently among academics about the extent of the persecution of Christians in the first two to three centuries of, of the church. The numbers may not actually be that high. We're talking thousands, not, not millions. Okay? We're talking thousands, not tens of thousands, that were, uh, that were killed in those early days of the Christian church. But let's remember, every single one of those thousands were precious children of God, people with families. They were fathers, they were mothers, they were sons, they were daughters, and every life is precious in the sight of God. And some... 
Christ could foresee would die as a result of persecution because of their faith. And so notice how Christ's closing words are so appropriate once again. He exhorts his followers to be faithful to death, for he himself has conquered death and lives forever. To those who stand firm in the faith, he will give a crown of life, that is, they will enter into eternal life. Verse 2, 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. What does that remind you of? Does it remind you of what Jesus said when he said, Fear not those who can kill the body and after that have no more they can do? But I'll tell you whom you should fear. Fear him who after, he, after death is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. The second death, the death after we have died, the punishment for sin is something a Christian need never fear. Death for the Christian is a doorway into eternal life. When Billy Graham was interviewed on Songs of Praise some years ago, I recall the, the person interviewing him, not sure if it was Steve Chalk, he asked, um, aren't you afraid of death? And Billy Graham said, oh yes, I, I'm certainly... He, he said, I'm afraid of dying. He said, I don't think it would be very nice. I'm not looking forward to it at all, but I'm not actually afraid of death, by which I mean what happens after. Death is not the end of my life. When I leave this body, I will go to be with the Lord and I will live on and live forever. And that is true of every believer in Christ, not just the privileged few Christian leaders whose names we know. The promise for those who overcome is given to these Christians at the church at Smyrna. People we've never heard of. We don't know their names. We don't know what they did. Nothing is written about them. They're not canonised. They're not made saints. We haven't got the story of Saint somebody or other from the first century church at Smyrna, like we've got the story of Saint Valentine. <laughs> but they were precious. And the promise is given to them. Even if persecution gets so severe that you're imprisoned, even if persecution gets so severe that you will die a physical death. Fear not, says Jesus. The second death has no power over you. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And if your name is in the Lamb's book of life, my friend, then you have nothing to fear in death at all. Do you know in the book of Revelation, right at the close of uh, this book of prophecy, we read, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection, over such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him for a thousand years. That's amazing, isn't it? Praise the Lord. The second death. Separation from God. Hell, if you like to call it that. Jesus did use that word on some occasions. Uh, that is not something the Christian has to fear when we die. We are absent from the body, but we are present with the Lord until such time as the resurrection takes place. And then body and soul reunited, changed gloriously to be like his glorious resurrection body. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. 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 Thank God for his word to us tonight. We give thanks.